this is the first hour of um, physics 1B for November 8th. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the first law of thermodynamics, sorry, the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the second law of thermodynamics has a, uh, a couple different ways of stating it, but in general, uh, it happens to do with something about the direction in which processes occur. So, for example, um, we know that heat tends to flow from hot objects to cold objects. That's part of the second law. Um, we also know that certain processes in nature tend to be irreversible. We're going to talk about what that means, but it, it kind of means what it says, that certain processes in nature only proceed in one direction. Um, we'll talk about what that means in a second. And in addition to that, uh, we're also going to be talking today about what are called heat engines. Um, a heat engine is something like, uh, you know, the, the internal combustion engine inside of a car is a heat engine. A heat engine is something that converts um, heat into mechanical energy. Um, a power plant, something that uh, burns fossil fuels or uses uh, some kind of nuclear process to produce heat and then turn that heat into mechanical energy and then turn that mechanical energy into electricity. So that's what a power plant does. Also a heat engine. And the second law of thermodynamics has something to say about that as well. And it says that it's impossible to construct a heat engine that is uh, that has 100% efficiency. So that's one of the things we're gonna talk about. This is something that is, um, I guess, kind of crucial to, to engineering in the sense that um, one of the biggest things you do when you're trying to design um, a project in engineering is to increase the efficiency, whatever whatever's going on. And there is a natural limit on uh, efficiency. You can't get to 100% efficiency. So we'll try to prove why that's the case today. It's kind of quite interesting to, to note that um, that it's impossible to construct a, a machine that's 100% efficient. So that's one portion of the second law of thermodynamics. And I don't know if we'll get there today, but um, there's also this thing that happens um, where disorder tends to increase in a lot of these processes and we can actually measure disorder um, kind of using that word is kind of weird but we can kind of measure disorder by uh, something called entropy and uh, that's going to be another way we can say something about the second law of thermodynamics which is that uh, um, entropy tends to increase in all um, of these thermodynamic processes so the second law of thermodynamics it's there's a lot of words for it, and it's largely because there's a lot of different ways to say it, but um, we're gonna build this up kind of slowly, as we'll talk about all the topics that are over here on the right. Um, reversible and irreversible processes, heat engines, the auto cycle, which is something that occurs inside of like the combustion engine in your car, refrigerators, and then we're gonna finally, if we, I don't know if we'll even get here today, but we'll eventually get to the point of talking about the different ways you can state the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the Carnot cycle, which is a special type of heat engine. Um, and, and that's the plan today. So there will be a little bit of math, but a lot of what we're going to talk about today is kind of just conceptual and theoretical. Okay. So let's, uh, let's start off by talking about reversible and irreversible processes. Okay. Um, so the first thing to state is that thermodynamic processes are always um, irreversible by nature. Irreversible. Okay. And what that means is they kind of only go in one direction and it's difficult to force the system to go back in the other direction. So to give you a really simple example of this, when you have, let's say you have a table that's a rough surface and on that table I have a box and we push the box in this direction with some kind of a force, and then we let go. The box will tend to start moving. It'll pick up some velocity, V, and then it'll eventually come to rest. Now, in this process, um, which is an irreversible process, mechanical energy in the form of kinetic energy uh, turns into internal energy, or you might say that heat is produced, however you want to say it, but the best way to say it is turned into internal energy. 
And it's very difficult to go back the other direction, okay? So that's why we call this irreversible, is while pushing this object on the table, the object comes to rest. The table probably has its temperature increase a little bit. The box probably has its temperature increase a little bit, right? What's hard to do though is to use this temperature increase, which is a form of energy that we've learned, and then turn it back into kinetic energy, right? And that's why we call this process irreversible because it's very natural to have a box sliding on a table come to rest. You could repeat that process over and over and over and over again. Take a box, slide it along the table, you know it's gonna eventually come to rest. But you're never gonna see a situation in which the temperature increase of the system can be used to drive the box back to this initial position here. So that's what we mean by irreversible. Does that make sense? Can you, okay, and it doesn't have to be a thrown in a process, but can, can you all give me some examples of things that occur naturally in nature that are not reversible? That are irreversible? That's what this means, not reversible. Can you think about anything you've observed in your life, anything, it doesn't matter what it is, that you can't imagine what you saw going backwards? Explosions, that's a perfect example. And that is a thermodynamic process, right? You take a firecracker or something, let's say just something simple like a firecracker, you light it on fire, it explodes into a bunch of little pieces, right? And there's no way that you could, it would be quite difficult to take all those pieces of the firecracker and put them back together again. Um, it might be impossible, in fact. It may be completely and totally impossible for the firecracker to, to like reform into itself, but it definitely would never do it on its own, right? Yeah, cooked food can't go back to being uncooked. That's, that's a really good example. I haven't thought about that one before. Yeah, if you, if you cook a steak, or you cook some noodles, uh, they're never gonna return to their original shape, not naturally at least. That's a good example. Uh, lightning? Sure, yeah. So, um, so thermodynamic processes are irreversible by nature. Um, while there are reversible processes that, uh, that exist in nature, um, the only way you can that, that it can happen is if the system is very close to um, thermodynamic equilibrium, okay? So for a reversible process, this is an example that they use. I don't think this is particularly clear, but we'll, uh, let me just write down what I said just real quick before we look at the picture. So reversible process. In order for something to be reversible, because of the nature of the way that temperature changes work and the, the fact that heat always flows from a hot object to a cold object, um, in order for a reversible process to occur, then um, the system has to be in thermodynamic equilibrium. And for the system to be in thermodynamic equilibrium, that pretty much means that, uh, well, you all tell me, what, is, what does that mean? We've, we've talked about this before. What does thermodynamic equilibrium imply? Same temperature? Yeah, pretty much. It has to be at the same temperature and uh, that's, that's pretty much what it means, exactly. Okay, so um, let's look at this picture right here. And you, you all can tell me if you think this is a, is a good example of this, I don't, I don't know. So it says, uh, in picture A, a block of ice melts irreversibly when we place it into a hot 70 degree metal box. Okay, so here's a hot box, uh, it's made of metal, which means that if it's made of metal, that means the heat can easily flow into or out of the system. And you place a piece of ice inside of there and of course, ice placed into something that's hot is going to melt. And it's saying, based on the amount of ice, I guess, that was put here, that the final temperature of the box and the ice ends up being 40 degrees, okay? And there's there's no way now, at 40 degrees Celsius, there's no way that the water will convert back into ice unless you remove a lot of energy from the system, which will reduce the temperature down to zero, which will um, violate the idea of thermodynamic equilibrium, 
Okay, so their example of a possible reversible thermodynamic process, and we are going to have to talk about these things because eventually we're going to be talking about the Carnot engine, which is going to be an engine that involves reversible processes, um, and it's an ideal engine, but we're still going to talk about it. Uh, in part B, we have a block of ice at zero degrees Celsius can be melted reversibly if we place it into a zero degree metal box. So what they're saying here is that we have a box that's at zero degrees Celsius and we have ice that's at zero degrees Celsius. The first question I would ask is like, wh where is the box? Is the box inside of a freezer? Is it, is it hot outside? I don't, I don't know, it's unclear. But the point is that we have a metal box that's at zero degrees Celsius. We have ice at zero degrees Celsius. If I want to make this work for myself in my mind, I would say that maybe the metal box is just gigantic. Like maybe it's so big that uh, um, we don't have to worry about temperature flow in or out. But either way, we have a metal box. It's maintained at zero degrees Celsius, possibly by being inside of a freezer or something like that. We put ice into that. And what they're claiming is that by infinitesimally raising or lowering the temperature of the box, we can make heat flow into the ice to melt it, or we can make heat flow out of the water to refreeze it. So that's what they would say is a theoretically reversible type of thermodynamic process. So what kind of questions does that arise for you or raise for, for each of you? What do you all think? Usually everything in contact has evened out heat, same temperature. That's true, Troy. When things are in contact, they do have evened out heat. I think I, I just don't understand this part of it where it says by infinitesimally raising or lowering the temperature of the box, we can make heat flow into the ice and melt it or make heat flow out of the water to freeze it. So like infinitesimally raising temperature, um, like here, like, if, in order to actually infinitesimally raise the temperature, we have to transport heat into the system. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense that if you put extra heat into the system, that you can melt the ice, right? And the system could stay at zero degrees Celsius. But the part that I find so weird is where they say by infinitesimally raising or lowering temperature. Because technically, you can make the ice melt without changing the temperature, right? Would you all agree with that statement? Yes, you can, right? Definitely. We know that ice will melt at zero degrees Celsius. You just need to put energy in the system. So what I wonder is, maybe that maybe this is an error, that they or, the, or they're just being kind of loose with the language here. Maybe what they mean to say is by infinitesimally adding heat to the system, or by by removing heat from the system, which is what they said in the second statement here. We can make heat flow into the ice and melt it, and make heat flow out of the water to refreeze it. So what I would assume that they mean is that we're going to send an infinitesimal amount of heat in here, dq, to make this process happen, and we're going to take out an infinitesimal amount of heat, dq, here, to make it to make it uh, to make it re return back this way, right? So if you add heat in, that's going to lead to that direction. If you remove heat from the system, it's going to make it go back to being frozen, right? So that's what they're considering to be a an example of a reversible process, okay? Um, and one thing we can say about reversible processes is that. Uh, they are what we call equilibrium processes, which is to say that they occur at a thermodynamic state of equilibrium. So it's almost another way of just defining it. A reversible process, equilibrium process, they mean the same thing in terms of um, thermodynamics. Okay, before we get into what's here, the next thing to mention is disorder. Okay. So most, or all, all, hmm. I think it's safe to say that, all irreversible processes which is, by the way, I want to be really clear right here, that even though we just talked about a reversible process, it's, this is, this is an ideal kind of like unrealistic process, the, the reversible process. 
all natural processes are going to be irreversible. Anyway, all irreversible processes tend to increase disorder. And I'm going to give you some really simple examples of this. Suppose that I have a table, right? And on the edge of the table, I have a glass, just empty glass, right? And I put a push, push the glass in this direction. So the glass falls to the ground. So here's the ground down here. The glass shatters into a bunch of little pieces, right? And what I would argue is that, so I'm, I'm gonna say something and I, we're gonna work on this as we go through this, but I often will use the wrong words for this kind of stuff. So I apologize if I do. This stuff is kind of complicated to talk about. Um, would you agree that the glass, when it's in its glass form, uh, that the molecules of the glass, that the pieces of the glass itself are more ordered than they are when it shatters into a bunch of different pieces. Would you all agree with that statement? Yeah, because the glass has a very specific shape. It's shaped like a cylinder. Uh, probably at the top, you know, the, the top of the glass is probably very reasonably circular as much as the manufacturer of that glass could have made it. Um, the bottom is also very circular. And there's probably like a very defined uh, shape to it. So would crystals be considered highly ordered? Absolutely. And the, and the glass itself is, it forms in a kind of crystalline kind of shape, right? If you go down to the molecular level, same thing with uh, stuff like metals and things like that. So yeah, crystals would be considered highly ordered because they have repetitive patterns that repeat themselves over and over again. Uh, crystals are kind of shaped as like lattices, which like kind of like look like tic-tac-toe boxes where you have like the molecules exit, you know, living on the corners of these these points right here and then in three dimensions as well. So the glass is very ordered in this state. And down here you have extreme disorder. Okay. So that's a natural process though, right? And, ir and it's irreversible because it's hard to imagine the shattered glass ever returning backwards. In fact, this is one of the things that we can use to know, let's say you're watching a video, right? And you notice in a video, a bunch of glass, from the ground, reorganizing itself into glass that is ordered like this, right? To like a normal drinking glass. You would know that the video is being run in reverse, right? Would you all agree with that statement? If you saw a video of a piece of glass like turning itself back into an ordered glass like this, you would know for a fact that it was running in reverse because th there's no way that could ever happen, right? Um, so, so when we say irreversible processes, what I always think when I, when I use that word, I just think of the word natural. Whoops. Natural. Because that's just the natural direction things go. And ten, things tend to go from order to disorder, right? Uh, the example your the book uses is it says, suppose that you have like a thousand um, names written on cards, like on little note cards. And suppose that they're all alphabetized, right? And you take that stack of names, thousand names, one on each card, and you throw it up into the air. Whenever those uh, things come down, let's say you just group them all back up together and, and kind of like re, re just square them back up, there's no way they're gonna be back in alphabetical order again, right? There's no way, because it's, it's gonna take work, physical work, to actually re-alphabetize all of those cards, right? So again, it's just an example of, of where, um, uh, you know, things tend to, to to lead to more disorder, okay? And what we're going to eventually say is that we can measure disorder uh, using something that's called entropy, and then we'll be able to scientifically say that instead of just saying that reversible processes tend to increase disorder, we're going to say that irreversible processes tend to increase entropy, and we can measure entropy. It has a, a mathematical number associated with it in units, and, uh, and we can go from there and talk about uh, some things associated with it. So there we go. So irreversible and reversible processes. Reversible processes require the system to be in thermodynamic equilibrium, which means that uh, you know the temperature needs to be roughly the same of the whole system, because if there's any temperature change at all, what happens when the temperature of molecules increases? Suppose, let's just look at a, at a really simple example here. Let's say that I have um, gas molecules, okay? And let's say that they're at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, right? 
and then we, we, we send energy into the system through heat, and the gas goes and heats up to a temperature of, let's say, 120 degrees Celsius now. And so now we've got our new molecules inside of here. We know that these molecules now have more kinetic energy, right? Which means that the distance, that means they're moving faster, right? That means that they're vibrating faster over larger distances. Uh, that also means that there's a higher probability they're going to collide with each other. It means that they're going to scatter more quickly throughout the system. Um, it may mean that if they're allowed to, that they might expand into the, um, they might expand a little bit. But uh, definitely in this process where the temperature was increased and you sent temperature into it, right? Due to there being more kinetic energy, this is going to be directly connected to having more disorder as well, right? So, um, anyway. Okay. So next thing we want to talk about are heat engines. And this is a picture of one, technically. Okay. So a heat engine is any device, I'll just call it maybe a, a machine, that converts Um, heat into mechanical energy. That's what a heat engine does. Examples of heat engines would be the internal combustion engine inside of a car, which I'll just write as ICE, internal combustion engine uh, in a car or in a, a truck or whatever. Um, a, uh, an electric vehicle, like a Tesla or a Volt or whatever, those, um, are not heat engines, right? They use energy in the form of a battery, which is chemical energy, and they convert the chemical energy into electricity, and the electricity is then used to, um, turn the wheels of the car, where you get the mechanical energy, right? So an internal combustion engine in a car, however, uses a fuel that it burns. And by burning that fuel, you get energy in the form of heat, which you can convert into mechanical energy, which is the rotation of the wheels of the car. And then eventually the, the speed of the car, the kinetic energy of the car, right? Uh, another example of a heat engine is a power plant. Okay, a power plant uses something like it burns coal, for example. If you have a coal-fired power plant, you burn coal and you know what, as far as the, let's do this one, because this one's pretty easy to describe and we can, we can refer back to it when we're trying to understand this picture right here. Okay. So let's talk about specifically how a power plant works. I don't know if we talked about this yet in this class, but even if we did, it doesn't ever hurt to go back over this. So simple example of how a power plant works is this, um, you have a boiler. Okay. So this is our boiler that's going to be used to do exactly what it says. It's going to boil water. We have a fuel down here. Could be coal, it could be gas, it could be whatever. It could be, it could be wood. It doesn't matter. You need some kind of fuel, right? You light the fuel on fire. You fill the boiler up with water. Okay. I'm going to need a little pipe down here too to, feed water and we'll deal with that later. Uh, when you heat water, if you get it hot enough, it will start to boil. So it will turn into steam. And um, this steam then is going to um, shoot out of the, the end of this, just like if you were to, to heat up uh, water in a kettle on your stove. And once the water starts boiling, uh, steam flows out the, the little hole in the in the kettle, and then it starts to make a loud whistling noise, right? And that's how you know that the, the water's boiling, and you can use it to make tea or whatever you're using it for. But what you do in the boiler is you use that steam and the energy that it has, the fact that it comes out of here really, really fast, and you connect it up to a turbine, and you just use the motion of the steam against the turbine, so we call this a turbine, 
which is literally just kind of like a windmill, water mill, whatever you want to think of it as. It's just something that's able to move, okay? And then, uh, then we're going to recollect our steam here as well. So how are we going to do that? I guess we'll just, we'll just say that the, the system is closed in or something like that. So that uh, we can make sure that this steam, uh, when it hits something that's cold, let's say this is like some kind of cold something. We'll talk about what that means in a second, but it's just some cold piece of metal, which will cause the steam to con condense. So you get condensation over here. So as the as the steam comes out of here, it uh, it's going to make the turbine move, which is eventually going to be turned into electricity or something like that. But eventually the steam is going to contact with this cold kind of surface right here, which is going to make it uh, turn back into water. Okay, and then we just feed a pipe back into here, um, so we can get the liquid water flowing in our system, and we don't need to. We can keep reusing the same water over and over again, basically, right? So then the water flows back into this direction, and then you repeat the process over and over again. Okay, so the process is we get energy from the fuel, we send it into the water, the water gets converted to steam, the steam expands, and then you, you force that steam to push through this little hole right here, which means it's going to be moving very quickly, and then um, it's going to cause the turbine to start turning. And that's basically the heat engine part of it. Now the question next would be, how do you actually get power out of this? Where does the electricity come from? And that's a question to be answered when you take physics 1C. But I can, I can tell you how it works. Um, but if you want to know the details, you want to take uh, Physics 1C or just go read about what's called the Faraday's Law of Induction. The idea is this, though. If this turbine is connected to a magnet or coil, like a, a bunch of loops of wire, right? Let's say that this turbine is connected to a, a bunch of loops of wire, like a coil like this, okay? And then inside of the coil, you stick a magnet. So you stick a magnet. So you've got a north end of our magnet here and a south end of our magnet here. And now what you do is you take this coil, if you can get this coil to start rotating, so let's say you have an axis that goes this way. So think of the coil being like, like right there, kind of like a, like a coin or something like that. And then if you can make the coil rotate around like this, you can make it spin around the magnet, then what will happen is that you will get electricity. And that's pretty much what happens. So somehow from the motion here, you have a coil that's then connected to the turbine, right? Maybe right here or something like that. And then it's going to make the coil spin. And what's going to happen is it's going to generate what we call an electromotive force, which is going to lead to electricity, which you can then send out to wherever you want to, because electricity can be easily transported uh, across large distances, whereas things like coal, gas, and wood cost a lot of money to move around, right? Like if you want to take a bunch of gas and bring it to your house, that's going to cost some money. You're going to need to, you know, move it. But electricity doesn't cost nearly as much money to move once you've already set up the infrastructure. So the whole point of this is to take your fuel source, turn it into mechanical energy in the form of a turbine, and then once the turbine starts moving, you get a uh, you attach it to a coil that moves around a magnet that generates electricity, basically. Okay. So does anyone have any questions about that process? Did that make any sense at all? Did you all find that very confusing? Feel free to ask questions. Have we talked about this before in this class? Probably not. I don't think we have. Okay, so that is the that is a great example of a heat engine because I think it's it's quite easy to understand. The internal combustion engine in a car is a little more complicated, but it's also a heat engine. Okay, and the idea is that if if you can if you can have heat energy of some type, there are ways that you can construct a machine that can convert the heat energy directly into mechanical energy. And just to remind you, by the way, what is when I say mechanical energy, I keep using that word. What is mechanical energy? Can you all remind me what that is? It's a phrase from physics uh, physics 1A. Now, conservative work isn't isn't a very good actual physical movement. That's a good example of it, yeah. What type of energy? The energy of motion, that's part of it. Okay, so the energy of motion, we also call that kinetic energy, right? Mechanical energy is kinetic energy. That's part of it. That's the energy of motion plus potential energy. That's what mechanical energy is. It's the sum of kinetic, yeah, that's exactly what it is, Richard, exactly. Mechanical energy is the sum of kinetic energy plus potential energy. Now, in the case of a turbine that's rotating around, it's I think it's purely just kinetic energy. Um, there are also, by the way, types of power plants 
that do not use heat, by the way. So a uh, hydroelectric dam, right? A hydroelectric dam produces electricity, but it does not use heat to do so. It uses the falling of water to do the exact same thing that I just described, right? Because if you have water falling over uh, a dam and you run the water over a turbine, now you've got a twisting turbine and you can again produce electricity, right? Um, the same thing is true of wind turbines. Wind turbines just use the motion of the air to make the turbines move, which you can then turn into electricity. Again, as long as you have, as long as you have some kind of mechanical motion, you can turn it into electricity. There are even, I've seen, uh, there's, there's a new type of, um, wind energy device that people are trying to develop that doesn't use gigantic wind turbines, but instead, I should find a picture of this. I don't even know if I'm able to describe it. But instead, it uses the vibration that can be created by wind. You know how, like, if you look at a if you look at a flag in the wind, it tends to flutter in the wind, right? Um, so they use these things that uh, that don't they don't necessarily spin around, but they just vibrate, and then through the vibration, they can even create uh, uh, electricity, which is kind of cool. But that's uh, kind of I guess a little bit off topic. But we were talking about power plants. I just wanted to kind of clarify that when I say power plant here, I don't mean a hydroelectric power plant. I don't mean a wind turbine. I don't mean solar power plant that uses the, the rays of the sun to produce electricity. None of those are heat engines. This is a heat engine. You have to have a fuel that you burn, or you have to have some kind of input of heat of some type, okay? I think a, a geothermal power plant that uses the heat of the earth is an example of one that is a heat engine that does not consume fuel. So there are types of heat engines that are renewable. Right, geothermal energy is re what we call renewable energy. What's renewable energy versus non-renewable energy? What is when I say renewable energy? What do I mean by that? What's the opposite of renewable energy? Is it non-renewable energy? <laughs> I can't remember. It's called non-renewable. I just that sounds that sounds right. Okay. Yeah. What is what is renewable energy? Electric is not an answer to that question. I'm sorry. Non-renewable energy is like fossil fuels. That's right. Why do we call that non-renewable? What does that mean? Why is it non-renewable? What does that mean? Only so many dead dinosaurs to siphon from. Exactly. The resources, the resource on our planet is finite. Exactly. So we call it non-renewable because we assume that if if we were to just, you know, if we didn't care about burning up all the coal, gas, and wood on our planet, um, we could eventually burn it all and we would run out. Yep. Okay. That's right, Kellen. It's a process that we that uses something we only have a finite amount of. So you might think about something like wood and say, well, this is something that we, 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 we kind of, we could, you could think that this is something that we can grow, right? So you might say something like wood or biofuels like corn. Um, you might say that those are renewable, but only to a certain extent, right? If we were to start using wood at a really large scale, it might be possible that we could, we could burn wood faster than we could produce it, right? So I think I would call this non-renewable. So what are examples of renewable energy? I don't think I saw any examples yet. Oh, Troy gave an example. The sun. The sun is a source of renewable energy, right? Sunlight. We can convert... Sunlight is... Technically, we will eventually run out of sunlight, right? I mean, technically, eventually, the sun's going to stop burning, but it's not going to be for billions of years, so we don't need to worry about it. Um, so, yeah, sunlight is pretty much an, an inexhaustible form of energy. In fact, it's... It's the reason why we have life on this planet is because we have a nice atmosphere and we get sunlight all the time and plants use that sunlight to produce oxygen that we breathe and plants also use that sunlight to produce fruit which we eat um, and we can use the sunlight to use to make solar energy using solar panels right okay so other examples of renewable energy are things like wind and water that's right because the wind is always going to flow so we can use that to make wind turbines to get renewable energy and water in terms of falling water um, we can use to produce energy as well. So those are examples of renewable energy. The process of water falling from the mountains down to the ground is renewable because eventually that water evaporates 
and then refreezes on the mountain in the form of snow, and then it melts again, and that process is repeatable. So those are renewable forms of energy. And why do we care about that? We care about it because, I mean, I don't know. When I first understood more about this idea here of a power plant and how it converts heat into fuel into electricity, which is something I think I learned about this probably, you know, so, some point in middle school, high school, or something like that. In one of my science classes, right, we learned about the difference between renewable and non-renewable energy. And for me as a kid, being like, you know, kind of idealistic, I thought, well, if we know about renewable energy, why do we ever use non-renewable energy? If we know we're going to run out of coal and gas, why are we burning it at all? Shouldn't we just save it and use it only when we really need it? I mean, there's an argument that gas is a, is a really nice uh, thing to have when you have a car and you need to be able to drive long distances. Fuel is a nice way to do that, right? But then also using that same fuel to provide our electricity to all our homes seems like a waste when we could also, when we could just be constructing, you know, wind turbines and stuff like that. But, uh, okay, let's see, what does is, what is Wynn say? You watched the video a long time ago. Norway and Belgium combined water and other sources to produce electricity. Water run down to turbine, produce electricity. One of the sources is not available. One of those are available. They use it to produce electricity and store water up high again. Oh, yeah, 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 right. So you can actually, so there, there's a... A, a recent development in renewable energy is people using gravity as a source of renewable energy. That's kind of what Wynn is describing. Yep. Troy says technological limits and fossil fuels are quick and easy for now. That's right. Um, anyway, but uh, there's also something else that we're not mentioning here, which is that uh, when, you, when you use this process of burning this fuel, uh, it does release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And the effect of that is that uh, it increases the CO2 content of the atmosphere, which makes it so that our planet is better at trapping heat through something called the greenhouse effect, wherein the sun's rays come in, but not all of them go out. So the planet slowly gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And then as the planet gets hotter and hotter and hotter, there are um, ecological consequences in terms of melting of ice caps and things like that, which leads to flooding, which leads to all kinds of other problems. And this is of course what we call climate change or global warming or whatever you want to call it. And uh, yeah, so that's the other reason that we want to use renewable sources of energy because they don't have these negative impacts on our environment. And negative impacts on the environment could be things as awful as destroying species, destroying habitats, or it could be as awful as destroying the planet itself, making it completely unlivable for us. So that's why while we talk about heat energies and we want to understand how they work in this class, it's also important to understand the kind of social responsibility associated with just burning a bunch of coal. Uh, Troy says, also to forget to mention, don't we have tide power generators? Yeah, that's that's right. That's another form of renewable energy is that they they use the motion of the tides to move turbines as well. You just put turbines under the water and then because the tide is the tides are never really going to stop. Right. And in certain areas, you have really, really heavy tides. You can use that to produce electricity as well. Um, there's a lot of people that don't like these, though. There's always pushback for any kind of new form of renewable energy. People don't like the tidal generators because they, you know, they need to be near the coast and, you know, not in my backyard, right? They need to be near the coast and the coast is a nice place to live. People want to have homes on the coast. They want to go to the coast to go to the beach and stuff like that. So you have to make sure that the, the turbines don't disrupt the kind of habitat of the coast in terms of disrupting, like, the habitat for the aquatic life, but also for people that want to, you know, use it as a place to kind of vacation and such like that. Anyway, okay, so let's talk about um, these heat engines now. So in a heat engine, um, we're going to have multiple pieces of things in here, okay? One of them is what we call, we'll use this as an example, the working substance. Okay, so we'll use this phrase from time to time. In the case of the power plant, the working substance is water. So the water is the thing that absorbs the heat gets converted into steam, the steam does work on the turbine, and then it condenses back into cold water, and then we repeat the process over and over again. Which means that this process that we're describing here is also a cyclic process. The simplest type of heat engines to talk about are, are um, heat engines that involve cyclic processes. This is obviously a cyclic process because the water started off as liquid water, at probably at a temperature of about 100 degrees Celsius here, right? Or actually, it's gonna be colder when it comes in, right? So you've got water here at some temperature, it's being heated up, it gets converted into steam, and then it gets eventually turned back into water. So that's how you know it's a cyclic process is because the water returns to its original state. It went from liquid to gas, then back to water again, 
and of course it gets cooled down, okay? Um, because, uh, because you need to have heat coming in the, to the uh, system, there's always going to be what we call hot and cold reservoirs. So these are going to be um, substances or something, we'll just call it something, that is maintained at, a, at, a, at either a hot temperature or a cold temperature. Do I have to write all this stuff down? This is, I think, is sometimes what takes me so long to, I don't have to write all this stuff down. So a hot and cold reservoir. So a hot reservoir would be something that's really hot that uh, is gonna provide a, a hot source of energy to the system. And a cold reservoir is gonna be something that is maintained at a cold temperature in order to uh, extract energy from the system effectively, right? So in our system here, this would be the hot reservoir, the, uh, the heat that's coming in here. It's like, a, it's like a reservoir of heat, effectively. It's a reservoir of hot temperature, whatever you wanna say. That's, that's the hot reservoir right there, the fuel that's just dumping heat energy into the system, right? And the cold reservoir would, would, would be this thing right here. Whatever cold plate you have over here that cools the water from heat and turns it into steam. Now, think about this. Suppose that your cold reservoir was just a piece of metal, right? And let's say that this piece of metal started off the day at uh, 20 degrees Celsius or something like that. So the steam comes in and it condenses on this object, right? What's gonna happen to the, to the cold reservoir as the steam condenses on it? Is its temperature gonna go up or is it gonna go down? It's gonna go up, exactly, okay? So in order for it to be a true cold reservoir, right? The idea has to be that it is, it is a substantial amount of material such that when the steam condenses on it, its temperature doesn't change substantially, right? At least over the course of let's say a day or something like that. So you need to maintain the temperature of these things so that they don't heat up too much because if the cold reservoir got really hot, then there'd be no way for the steam to condense back to water and what would happen to the system? If there's no way for the steam to convert back to water, what would happen to the system? It would just be all steam. And if it's all steam, uh, it wouldn't run out of fuel necessarily. That's not true. That's not necessarily true. You could still be dumping fuel into it, but you would just have a big box of hot steam, right? Oh yeah, that's an important distinction there to make, which is the water is not the fuel, right? It's an important distinction to make. The water is just what we call the working substance that is being heated up and cooled down and heating up and cooled down, right? Okay, so um, the hot reservoir is typically at some temperature that we call TH. The cold reservoir is at a temperature that we're gonna call TC. And the idea is that, uh, you know, that, that the hot reservoir can, can send energy into the system without appreciably changing its heat and the cold reservoir can be maintained at that same temperature that we call TC, okay? Does that make sense? All right. Um, another thing to say is that because uh, the change, okay, so it's a cyclic process, right? What does that mean? What do we know about cyclic processes in terms of the first law of thermodynamics? What do we know about cyclic processes? Internal energy is zero, not quite, that's close though. It goes back to its original state, that's right. What does that mean about its internal energy? No change in internal energy. That's right. So, uh, the here, let's write it over here. So we know that uh, the third, second, first law of thermodynamics is that the change in internal energy is equal to Q minus W. And if this is zero, if the change is zero, that means that Q is equal to W, right? Um, now we're going to be talking about two different types of Qs in these processes. So what we're going to say is that QH. Q sub H is going to represent the heat um, that comes in from the hot reservoir. Uh, I think now we can start looking at this picture. There's some stuff on here we haven't talked about yet, but I think it's okay to start looking at this picture at least. Uh, that's going to be off screen. We'll put it. I'll put it up here maybe and just move this stuff. Okay, so this picture right here is supposed to be a heat engine. I can make it a little bit bigger. It's a schematic energy flow diagram for a heat engine. So this isn't the heat engine itself. It's just a way that they that we're going to use to 
to kind of, this is like a free body diagram for heat engines, right? It's a, it's a schematic way to look at what's happening, okay? Okay, so we know these processes are cyclic and we're gonna have a hot reservoir. Again, in the case of the power plant, that's the fuel down here. We're gonna have a cold reservoir, which is gonna be the, the cold plate over here that's cooling down the water. And we're gonna have the engine, which is represented by the circle right here, okay? So QH is the heat coming in from the hot reservoir. So you can see hot reservoir at temperature TH right here, the hot temperature. QH comes in, and we're gonna define this as being positive when uh, the, uh, um, we'll try it over here, this is gonna be positive when the heat comes into the system. Maybe I need to write that on the second line. Do I? I don't have to write everything. I'll just say positive. And I'll just say that this is positive QH when heat flows into the system. And that's consistent with the way we defined positive Q for the first law of thermodynamics, right? Okay, then we're gonna find QC as the heat that goes into the cold reservoir, which is at a temperature of TC, okay? So QC is gonna be heat. Um, you might say it's leaving the system. It's not really leaving the system. It's basically the heat that's dumped into the cold reservoir. Okay. So it's the heat that's dumped into the cold reservoir. This one is going to be negative by nature. And why is it negative? Why would QC be negative? So if our, if our system is the engine itself, right? And the engine is placed into thermal contact with the hot temperature and the cold temperature, right? then why do we say that QC is negative? Is, is that consistent with the way we defined uh, heat transfer in the previous chapter? I noticed two people said eternal energy. You all understand that's not eternal energy, right? It's internal energy. Maybe that was autocorrect. I know sometimes there's some weird autocorrects with the systems. Yeah, Q is negative when heat leaves the system. So this is not a new thing, okay, right? But QH by, by nature is gonna be positive and QC is gonna be negative because QC is leaving the system, QH is coming into the system, right? We call the, the, the engine is basically the system, right? Okay. Um, yeah, there we go. So with those definitions, does it do work on the cold reservoir? I don't think so. No, I don't think so, Troy. Because in order for the system to do work, there has to be some kind of like expansion or motion or something. Um, but, uh, you know, the moving pistons, well, we'll get to that, but the, the moving pistons that occur inside of like the internal combustion engine of a car, um, the, the gas in the system is gonna do work on the pistons to make them move, right? But th that doesn't, I don't think that has anything to do with the cold reservoir though, and doing work on it. Again, um, it's probably better to stick with the example that we started with here. Um, the reason I use this example is because it's the simplest and we're going to talk about the motion of pistons and how the internal combustion engine works, but let's wait till we talk about that before you start worrying about that. Anyway, okay, so positive QH coming in, negative QC going out, and what we'd like to now figure out is how much work can you actually get out of the system? So a heat engine is something that converts heat into mechanical energy, and the question would be, how much mechanical energy can I get out? How much work can my engine actually do? Because ultimately, if you're designing an engine for a car or a power plant, one of the most important things to understand is how much work are you going to get out for the energy that you put in, right? If you put a thousand joules of energy in and you only get one joule of work out, that's not a very efficient system, right? Does that make sense? If you, only, if you put in a thousand joules here and you only get one joule of work out of it, even if you repeat that process over and over and over again, you, you, you might wanna kind of make the system more efficient so you can get more work out of it, right? So that's what we're going to talk about is the efficiency. All right, first of all, we know that Q is equal to W. In this case, the total amount Q that goes into the system is going to be equal to QH 
plus QC, okay? And I say plus because QC is technically negative, so the net, you call this like the net heat flow per cycle, and that's important to understand that this is per cycle, um, is gonna be Q equal to QH plus QC, or we can write that as the absolute value of QH plus, no, not plus, oops, minus the absolute value of QC. Because if QC is negative, then if we take the absolute value of it to fix this equation, we gotta put a minus sign right there, right? Now we know that the work done is equal to Q because it's a cyclic process. So that means that the work done is also equal to QH minus QC. And we're going to define the efficiency of our engine. This is the problem we're gonna do here in a second. Push it down a little bit. So we're going to define um, the efficiency. The book calls it thermal efficiency, so I guess I could call it the same thing. Thermal efficiency um, of our heat engine. is gonna be E, so little e is gonna be the efficiency, is gonna be equal to the amount of work done by the system divided by the, temp not the temperature, but the amount of heat that flows into the system here, okay? By its very nature, this number is always gonna be less than one, okay? So E is gonna be less than one. And that's because there's always gonna be, there always gonna have to be some amount of energy that you dump into the cold reservoir. Otherwise we can't repeat the process, okay? Just to refer back to the, the power plant example that we're giving here. Um, if all of the energy that came in was converted into work to rotate the system right here, and none of it went back into the cold reservoir, then you couldn't repeat the process, basically. You have to have, this is a crucial part of any engine, is you have to expel some amount of energy out of the system if you want the system to repeat the process. If all you care about is to take all that fuel and then directly turn it into energy without repeating the process, that's fine, but it'll be like a one-time use system, right? And we're looking for a cyclic process, something that we can repeat over and over and over and over again and get energy out of it each time. Um, and so that's why you have to have the cold reservoir. And that means that W, if you look at it right here, which is equal to QH minus QC, right? Is always going to be, um, this number is always gonna be smaller than this number right here, right? And we can, we can see that if we just combine this equation and this equation here. So if E is equal to W over QH and QH is equal to this, So that's what the W is, that's the work done. The difference in the heat between the hot and the cold reservoir, the heat that comes in versus the heat that goes out. And we divide that by QH. Then this is gonna be equal to, um, well, there's, there's two different ways to write it, right? We'll do it both different ways. So one way to write this then would be, take the absolute value of all this stuff, and what we end up getting is one minus the absolute value of QC divided by QH. Okay, so that's one way to define our efficiency right here. The other way to define it is just without um, without using the um, absolute value signs, we could write that from this line right here that the work is QH plus QC. We divide by QH, and then this would be equal to one plus QC over QH but you have to remember that QC is negative. So I think that's why this is probably the preferred version of the equation you wanna memorize. You take the ratio of Q cold over Q hot, one minus that is your efficiency, okay? Does that make sense? So let's talk about this equation and how it works. So your efficiency is gonna be a number between zero and one. Would you all agree with that statement? Okay. 
the biggest this could ever be would be one. And when would it be equal to one? It would be equal to one when QC was much smaller than QH, right? But the biggest it's ever really gonna be, maybe it might be something like 99%. In reality, maybe it's something like 75%. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, this, this implies that an efficiency equal to one is impossible because as long as you're expelling some amount of energy out of your system, then, uh, then this ratio is gonna be non-zero, which means your efficiency will be less than one. Okay, so we've defined efficiency. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna analyze a heat engine based on this information that we've been given here, okay? And see if we can understand something about how we calculate efficiency and stuff like that. Um, we can ask this question now, actually. I think it'd be best, best to ask this now. So based on this here, let me, uh, let me make sure I have all the equations on the page. I think we do. So the equations that we're gonna care about for this are gonna be this equation here, and I guess this one too, so I'll write this one, or, well, don't need to rewrite it. This is the other one. Yeah, that looks bad. Here, we'll just write it over here. Work equal to QH minus QC. So with these four equations here, try to answer this question here. Hopefully you can see the full wording of the question on the page. It says to rank the following heat engines in order from highest to lowest thermal efficiency. So number one is an engine that in one cycle absorbs 5,000 joules of heat and rejects 4,500 joules of heat. Maybe it helps to have this uh, this picture here too on the, on the screen might help. Let me make sure it's not blocking. Looks like it's not. Okay, so it says rank the following heat engines. Okay, and number one, an engine that in one cycle absorbs 5,000 joules of heat and rejects 4,500 joules of heat. So you all tell me, this 5,000 joules, is that QH or QC? It absorbs 5,000 joules of heat and rejects 4,500 joules of heat. Yep, this is QH and this is QC, right? Okay. And see now, notice that it says it rejects 4,500 joules of heat. It doesn't say negative 4,500. You have to know that because it's rejecting it that it's pushing it out, that that's negative, right? Okay, so that's number one. Number two is an engine that in one cycle absorbs 25,000 joules of heat and does 2,000 joules of work. Okay, so now we have work and heat, right? Which is this equation. And then number three, an engine that in one cycle does 400 joules of work and rejects 2,800 joules of heat. So it's basically the three different possibilities of information that could be given, okay? So some of these you're gonna have to kind of like work it out. So why don't you all try to solve that? Tell me, can you rank in the order one, two, three, you know, just say, it says from highest to lowest thermal efficiency, these three heat engines, and I'll give you a minute or two, maybe two minutes. Oh, you know what? We need to take a break. So this is a great place to just say, let's take a break, try to answer this question. We'll come back in 10 minutes and talk about it, okay? So let's do that. So function shift.